uh, i just started the youtube okay ji so uh, dipu if uh, the if time permits then we can have the ultrasound lecture uh, as you no. said because <laughs> there some problem uh, dr dipo uh, yes sir uh, actually i uh, i come to uh, jipmar but i am staying in uh, pondi in the club mahindra there is some problem in the wifi okay okay sir okay so all my laptop everything is uh, ready but it is not i am not able to connect so uh, actually i don't know how to share uh, my uh, all the things are uh, set up but uh, you can see here i have set up so what uh, i it could be only what we can do is you just uh, whatever the case, i am not able to all the cases i have collected but i don't think i will be able to show you i am putting in the uh, my uh, one second putting in the one second let me check then I, i meanwhile i'll do panel whatever the cases i can do but i think uh, very difficult for me right now it's uh, tough actually very uh, unfortunate let me see okay sir five minutes five minutes because okay, okay, of all the cases i've got eh uh, mm, on five minutes sir let me check again can do something about it is it okay, that sir. is that one what is that no yeah, no no that is also okay ha ha okay so you can share your ppt with dr dibu he can share it on screen no no the ppt is uh, even the, the net is uh, not going that is a problem the ppt is uh, the whole thing some videos and other things um uh, so a little bit of uh, very from 7 o'clock i'm trying to do all these things but there are some problem in this particular uh, uh, i thought i couldn't go because i came for a fellowship exam then i thought i'll stay here and in the resort i am not able to get the connected i i couldn't let me just say five minutes leave me sir okay sir last uh, last last trial uh, dipu yes sir Okay. Okay. Name is so much other methods. Last one. I work. Yeah. I work. Yes, sir. Okay. Vijay Kumar sir, is it? Hey, thank you, sir. Wait, 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 wait. Vijay Kumar sir is the right thing. Yes, sir. Ah, sir, join Jai Ram. One minute, one minute. I'm doing that, sir. So one minute. Huh? 
गुड इवनिंग सर जमर सर हेलो गुड इवनिंग शिबु गुड इवनिंग अजय सर वाई दैट्स अ प्रॉब्लम लेट मी डिस्कनेक्ट एंड देन अगेन स्क्रीन स्टार्ट ह Sorry, sir. Five five minutes. I'm just trying to see whether I can get something out of this. Okay. Oh, okay, sir. No, no, no. I'm not able to get uh, even the, this one. Morning, I want to try at home. So, home was better. Training is connecting nicely. Let me just check. No, no, maybe I don't know. Is there a way to? No, I can see the everything is connected. I can see this is okay. Let me premium and check. Okay. Okay. Okay, so even Google is not able to help me to do that. Okay. But so this you connect this uh, at least iPhone charger. Let me go through this. Okay, no problem. Just let me go through that. Let, let them see. Okay. uh no problem i will just um, uh, see there is nothing much to present okay dr uh, dipo you uh, yes. you present the slide okay 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 sir okay. the audio is okay because i'm five never i always a good uh, lighting and all now there's a problem anyway the audio is okay okay sir you can present then i'll discuss at the end of it what you can do is you can ask um, shilpa to give the talk on the tarval sound and then i'll see whether i can uh, share something in that okay okay sir yeah yeah you can do that yeah yeah please pradeep shall you pradeep shall you start yeah yes, yeah, sir. yeah 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 so so very good evening uh, welcome you uh, all to the monthly critical care program iip intensive care chapter our chairperson dr shija is not available today so myself dr shiju kumar i am a consultant picu himself trandum i will be facilitating the program uh so our topic for discussion will be today is a difficult pediatric airway i think most of the critical care physician pediatrician would have encountered this problem so we have two eminent panelists to throw more light on this and the session will be moderated by dr deepu dr deepu is a convener of iap intensive care chapter kerala and he is a consultant pediatrician and intensivist in molana hospital pendalmanna and he has lot of publication in this study so over to dr deepo thank you shriju respected iap president vijay kumar sir respected faculties dr ramesh sir and dr shilpush bosle and other senior doctors and my dear friends and colleagues good evening to all today we will be having a panel discussion on pediatric difficult airways we have two eminent faculties one is dr ramesh he is a consultant pediatric anesthesiologist he is practicing exclusive pediatric anesthesia for last 35 years and is the first to start pediatric critical care at kanji kamagodi child trust hospital and he has given 14 orations and he is a committee member of all india difficult airway guidelines another faculty is dr shilpush j posle he has done dm critical care medicine and fellowship in pediatric critical from university of toronto and current position is professor division of Pedi uh, division of critical care medicine department of anesthesiology and critical critical care and pain tata memorial center mumbai and his area of interest is use of bedside ultrasound so i'll be sharing the slides we'll be going like a, we have we had few cases of difficult airways which i collected from different other faculties also from kerala and i'll be sharing that case and our we'll be discussing with our faculties and how to go ahead in this difficult airway scenarios
slide visible yeah 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 we can see the slides so we'll be going like case scenarios and if time permits we'll be having electron intubation injuries and airway ultrasound and first case this was a case came to our hospital around one year back 13 year old boy he had a history of sudden onset of breathlessness in the morning and they had gone to a hospital and from there nebulizations were done and came back to home and suddenly he collapsed and taken back to the same hospital and he was intubated from the emergency there by anesthetist and there was history of profuse bleeding from trachea during intubation as told by the anesthetist there and was intubated and referred to our hospital and on arrival child was hemodynamically stable and we ventilated the patient and uh, in view of the profuse bleeding and we need to uh, change the endotracheal tube because of the tube block and ent opinion was taken and have done a laryngoscopy in view of the history of bleeding and it showed a mass arising from the lateral wall of larynx it has and the resection of mass was done once patient was stable and the histopathology report came as hemangioma it was a pedangulated mass in this picture you can see here is the et tube endotracheal tube intubated this was the mass here also here uh, this is well uh, extubated the patient was extubated and reintubated before the procedure you can see the occult cords and this uh, pedangulated mass and the probably this mass might have caused a sudden collapse of the child and unresponsiveness so to remember sir uh, in this case how we will proceed if we are uh, two scenarios can occur suddenly while intubating if a sudden profuse bleeding from the tracheal tube or while if they non uh, to have a swelling uh, uh, mass in the airway upper airway so how we will proceed in such cases sir? can i go to the previous slide See, I feel there are two things uh, which happened. One is a 13-year-old boy referred intubated outside via sudden onset respiratory distress and he collapsed. Okay. I think at that particular time, I think people uh, when they they had when they are intubating, I think I am not sure. May not be an expert or may not be intensive care people. Uh, maybe someone who are intubated. I think you should have noticed that mass. i think that has not been uh, uh, really written at that particular time number 1 number 2 because it's collapsed and uh, most of the time i'm not sure what the people are doing outside i feel the people are uh, it may be on the outside in the um, in any of the place outside the hospital what they do is they as soon as it's an emergency situation so they were intubated so when they came into the hospital they provided the trachea during intubation and being ventilated when it is getting and to remove the tube uh, i think i i'll be very uh, unhappy to remove the tube with a lot of difficulty of put the tube so there's a tube is inside i think we should do a probably at this particular time i feel that uh, yeah, an expert should have been there to look into why there's a bleeding because bleeding inside somehow you have put the tube i'm not sure whether the tube is inside probably i'm sure it should be confirmed by the etc or two because uh, once the etc is coming inside you keep sucking the endotracheal tube and then check whether it is uh, okay and then i think uh, if possible if everything is available that particular time video laryngoscope will definitely will help you out because video laryngoscope will be help you out to know exactly where is the tumor and do a laryngoscopy is the what it is and the people who put the tube unless it is a child is you feel there's a bad at remove it and putting another tube without looking into it when you want there's a tube inside if you want to reintubate please do a laryngoscopy before exp under vision i think better to take the tube out that's what i felt and the ent opinion was taken letting us showed a mass during the lateral view i think this is a very very uh, i'm sure it is not emergency they have taken over because once the tube is inside you can wait for some time and uh, it has come to your expert probably intensive care and anesthesia i would be happy to put the cuff tube in this particular situation because when you put the cuff the bleeding outside may not be a problem i think the intubating must look into what are the problems before extubating and then you must uh, see if there is a video laryngoscopy will uh, document what exactly is happening and we can wait till the things are all over if the bleeding i think that's okay resection was done i think that's all right 
but i think it's a um, little for a non expert it's little difficult oh okay, okay. hi deepu i have uh, i have a couple of uh, uh, you know queries about this case yes sir so one is uh, i believe he had a acute onset respiratory distress for which he was intubated right yes yes and then the diagnosis was made about the tracheal hemangioma yes isn't it so yes. uh, you know there are two things one is um, uh, when you have a airway bleeding again it is a airway emergency that is one second is when uh, at what level was the uh, hemangioma uh that is uh, that is the second aspect and third is wa- was it obstructing um the airway completely or was because it was pedunculated generally you would be able to shove the tube um, you know around the hemangioma and uh, you can get the definitive airway the problem is how did the ent um, you know get rid of the hemangioma like was it done uh, uh, how was the airway procedure done because generally what happens is um though it's not it's more of an anesthetic challenge rather than an intensive care issue because in, intensive once you have the definitive tube inserted then um, there's no issue with ventilation as long as you know your the the tra- the airway is not soiled because of the bleeding uh, but if the patient continues to bleed then uh, what is the way to um, you know um, arrest that bleed and second is what is the the second part is how is the hemangioma being removed because obviously there is a problem with carrying the airway with the ent surgeon uh, was there a radiological um, you know a ct scan done to look at the extent of uh, you know the, the the tumor or the origin of the tumor and you know the behavior of the tumor so all these questions are actually not really uh, reflecting from this uh, Uh, sir actually this patient uh, became stable within 24 hours and we were planning a we were planning a laryngoscopy by that time the patient was taken for ct scan before the procedure and ct okay. neck was taken that time patient had a tube block and i had to remove the tube because i was worried to remove the tube because of the history i thought i will make sure sure that airway is stable before removing the tube but i had to remove from the ct room because it had a sudden tube block and sudden i pulled out and child was actually relatively okay after giving ambu back for a few seconds child became okay so then only ct was completed and ct was showing some mass a small mass in the larynx but it could not make out this hemangioma i don't know why then it was patient was taken directly for laryngoscopy that time itself then only it was shown okay mass arising from the lateral wall of larynx so ent electively procedure was planned on the same day evening itself electively procedure planned and intubated by anesthetist with a small size tube and it was a resection procedure was done that is what happened okay so the laser excision was done or like uh... no uh, it is called not laser excision it Quartrized. was cauterized okay okay any other suggestions for this yes, so um uh... Uh, I, i mean uh, dr ramesh would um, because he, um, he he generally sees uh, such cases very often um so um, i'll wait for his comment uh, i think that's all right i think if you are in an emergency i don't know where intubator i think we must congratulate the person who intubated the child uh, in the uh, somewhere else i'm not sure who was intubated but uh, a child is, uh, to intubate Uh, in a um, emergency situation is going to be tough and probably when you are intubating i am sure that uh, it's uh, you know injured during the hemangioma and that would cause you to be the bleeding and gone inside and then that is the blood you would have uh, uh, you know sucked out and all these things i think uh, yeah, the person who was uh, who must be uh, really uh, appreciate the person who intubated at that time when he collapsed i think that's a good at that time i think when you are a little bit i'm not sure when you are probably an expert or a little experienced person who can do it i think the most of the juniors what they do is they intubate just uh, without no seeing the uh, peripheral things and then they just intubate and then it will keep going so once intubated they all forget that everything is okay luckily the patient bled 
So we are able to find out what exactly is the problem. If the patient is not bleeding, we would have even neglected the mask for some more time and uh, we, will, we must be in a collapse and all these things. I think when you're intubating, the uh, thing is that we must be able to uh, see what are all, maybe you might have a vallecular cyst or something obstructing and then there's uh, something which is, uh, I, you must look into all the uh, tooth which has been broken. All these things must be seen around the glottis and that you must put the tube. I think that's what I'm uh, telling all the people. I'm sure the overall intensive will be able to do that. And having uh, put the tube, I think it's very important, lucky that he has uh, removed it. I, I, I would prefer that this is one of the conditions where I feel still, I feel that we must have a cup tube in this, cup tube in this, which is a smaller tube, but it was a cup tube because it will be uh, really, if you're, uh, you see, uh, during the excision itself, there'll be a lot of bleeding and it will go inside and then you have to suck it out. And then after excision also, most most of the time, the hemostasis will be almost 100% secured by the ENT surgeon, but it may be a little difficult. Thank you, sir. So, uh, in this, the take home is anyway, we should use cuff tube in this scenario, and video larynx SOP will help you a lot. Shilpur, uh, uh, Shilpur, must uh, he can give some input in this. Yeah, because Shilpur. generally we we deal with uh, uh, you know airway tumors a lot, and um, uh, we always uh, struggle, uh, you know, sharing the airway with the ENT surgeons or the oncological surgeons. Uh, so the issue is one is to have a clear plan, uh, you know, when you deal with such patients, if now uh, you've already got a tube in place, but suppose if you don't have a tube in place and you have a, you have this patient coming for an elective procedure, you need to have a, a clear discussion with uh, the oncological surgeon, how he is going to treat it. Uh, sometimes they would plan for a sclerotherapy. Sometimes they, they plan for upfront excision. And um, in, the, in those cases, like if you are using laser, generally what we do is uh, if you have some space around the, around the, uh, the trachea, uh, since this is a 11 year old child, um, it's a, uh, He's, he's a relatively big big boy. So, now what um, what we generally do is we use uh, you know high flow nasal oxygen and that is Thrive. And um, uh, sometimes if they are if, now this is a pretty superficial tumor. If you have a tumor that is deep down into the trachea, then um, you need to have scope for. Uh, uh, rigid bronchoscope, you need to have, uh, you know, discussion with a, a chest physician who can actually cauterize because they use a fiber optic bronchoscope through the rigid bronchoscope to actually cauterize with a flexible, uh, you know, guide wire tips. Uh, and that's how they deal with uh, most of the tracheal tumors. Uh, how we uh, provide um, anesthesia and, um, you know, airway uh, care is by using either a ventilating bronchoscope. So uh, from that rigid bronchoscope, we would ventilate from the side port of the bronchoscope. Or if you are not using the bronchoscope and we are sharing the, the airway with the, uh, with the surgeons, then we would keep them on Thrive. So, and Thrive would give 100% oxygen uh, and also provide apneic oxygenation for a reasonably long time. So we did a study where we had apneic oxygen, oxygenation for almost uh, more than 50 minutes. And that was pretty staggering. Like it was unbelievable for us also to, to know that the apneic oxygen was uh, was provided uh, up, up to the tune of 50 minutes, which is pretty which is pretty safe uh, when you are actually sharing the area with surgeons. Okay, sir. Thank you. So uh, uh, folks who don't use Thrive, it is uh, high flow uh, nasal oxygen. Um, again, two liters per kg uh, we use, but it is humidified. So um, uh, it does, uh, you know, does help providing 100% oxygen um, during these airway, airway surgeries. Okay, sir. So we'll go to next case, sir. This was a case shared from Amrutha by Dr. Sajit. There's a one month old baby and naturally detected to have right mediastinal bronchogenic cyst, had severe respiratory distress while coming to emergency and had was hypoxic and required intubation. And this was the, I don't have any picture of the patient. This is the X-ray picture where you can see a mass with a trachea being shifted to the opposite side. And it is airways narrow here. 
So the intubation was difficult and with anesthesia help only they have done the intubation. So if uh, such patients with a neck swelling comes, so in emergency, how to go ahead, sir? Shilpo, Dr. Shilpush Bosley. Uh, so external compression. Yeah. So see, mediastinal masses um, uh, do pose a significant airway challenge uh, in you know pediatric population. Like people, uh, you know, if you ask parents, parents would generally say that uh, kids are uh, extremely difficult. Um, yeah. So for us. Uh, apart from the uh, airway challenge, whether it is anatomical or physiological challenge, because uh, uh, the younger the kid, the the uh, the um, uh, severity uh, of uh, managing the airway in increases. And if you are dealing with a mediastinal mass, then um, uh, it becomes even more challenging because of the airway compromise. There would be comp compromise of the um, uh, the um, uh, great vessels also. Sometimes what happens these uh, uh, these mediastinal structures masses, whether it is a is it, whether it is a um, you know bronchogenic cyst in this case, or whether it is a, a small thymoma or a lymphoma or anything of that sort. So not necessarily a, a bronchogenic cyst. Uh, it does cause uh, airway compromise and it does cause uh, um, a, a significant airway challenge. Now, for a one-month-old child, what it what it um, does is we tend to um, uh, I would try and generalize all the um, uh, you know airway tumors uh, so that uh, people can take a broad outline. Um, how do we approach uh, these cases when we are having a, a mediastinal mass? So uh, one is we we assess the severity of uh, uh, distress or severity of the um, airway compromise. That is one, either clinically or radiologically. Um, so X-ray here would give you a reasonable idea about uh, the tracheal compression, uh, but generally. Uh, uh, we would look at uh, the CT scan and look at the extent of the tumor um, to see whether you know uh, we will be able to get across the uh, across the compression part. So that the key is to get um, get beyond the tracheal compression. Uh, the deviation may not be um, that uh, uh, significant, but uh, the compression would be um, significant. So uh, the rule of thumb is if the compression is more than fifty percent. Uh, of the airway, uh, generally um, uh, we 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 would uh, raise an alarm uh, if it is a if it, if there are lymphomas or uh, other uh, malignancies, we would uh, upfront give them chemotherapy and then or or steroids and try and uh, not fiddle with the airway. Uh, if the uh, uh, if the on the CT scan, if you have uh, maybe fifty percent or less than fifty percent airway compression, we would try to uh, use and if we have to take him for a definitive surgery for in this case if it is a bronchogenic cyst we might have to excise it uh, if it was uh, uh, if it was any other tumor then and we, if we have to do uh, anesthesia uh, or if we have to secure the airway in this case we generally take them into the OR and uh, uh, take under inhalational uh, 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 anesthesia uh, maintaining the airway and we try to uh, make sure that the um, we bypass the compression. So the sometimes you get a very long microlaryngeal tube. Suppose if it is a distant tumor uh, into the uh, into the uh, uh, anterior mediastinum, we would use long microlaryngeal cuff tubes, uh, which are slender and long, which can uh, actually go uh, beyond the tu beyond the tumor. Or uh, sometimes we have to end up uh, if it is around the carina or at the bronchus, then we end up uh, intubating the. Uh, the bronchus uh, and then withdrawing, uh, but we try and go beyond the tumor so that uh, during the surgery also the tumor does not compress the airway and uh, there is no loss of uh, you know ventilation uh, in that case. Okay, so Ramesh sir, any suggestion, sir? No, Shilpa, I just want to ask you a question that. Um, you, this child, you told me you can do a CT, but I'm a little worried how to do a CT for this one-month-old child. What is your... Uh, I think uh, a medicinal tumor coming for a CT or ultrasound is... Uh, uh, I think in the theater setup, you are, uh, what you're talking about is quite okay. But in case you're going to go for a CT or MRI, 
uh, what's your mode of sedation or how will you keep the child quiet or uh, in one month a child may not may be all right but if the older child we might have to do something else but what is your uh, yeah so generally that? yeah yes sir. so that's a big concern is to have the diagnostic modality on these patients so uh, especially on a ct scan suit which is like a remote location you need to have uh, uh, expert hands at place to do these procedures so what we do is um, uh, i miss to uh, uh, you know tell folks that you know you need to ask family or parents what is the comfortable position that the child lies in if he is if he is comfortable lying prone we know that in case of rescue we can prone him and uh, uh, have a reasonable open airway so uh, 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 regarding the anesthesia part for um, uh, for diagnostic procedure for ct scan what we generally do is if he is we if he is not in distress we will take him on gas um, uh, on uh, or gas inhalational um, we will take him under and before he because ct hardly would take uh, one uh, ct cut would take hardly uh, a minute or so so once he is under he will be on hudson's mask and he would uh, get the scan in and out uh, if the kid is very uh, uh, is like difficult to uh, uh, go for anesthesia then we would generally ask them to do under chloral Uh, or maybe uh, you know uh, nasal midazolam or something like that chloral would have been uh, uh, would have been another option chloral hydrate shilpa i think uh, what uh, is quite all right you are talking about the place where your inhalational is available in a ct scan room and that we are talking about a co fluid in a ct scan room i think deepu will agree with me that many of the ct scan room in many places they don't have the anesthesia machine and that is the situation uh, because many times i have been called uh, most of the ct scan room uh, ct scan in many of the places even in chennai it is like a tea shop in even in the road side everything will be there so it's a little bit of a difficult situation so i don't know i want the people who are intensivists to when call to give some sedation they'll give the usual sedation or dexmed or propofol then they get into all problems so i just want to tell you because if the inhalation probably that's the best but it's not available in many places uh, i almost about 95% of the places where you are uh, uh, taking the ct scan in institutional uh, wise i think that's all right so uh, yeah, i just so, want to tell yeah yeah i completely agree with your point sir and um, the reason is um, see um, uh, Uh, these patients have to be handled by skilled people at skilled centers um, you cannot do it uh, at a at a roadside uh, ct scanner where um, you know there is no um, uh, uh, specialist who's handling the airway or no uh, you know uh, no help who, who where you can uh, you know get when it is needed so uh, this is a specialized uh, um uh, you know uh, case where you have to have a specialist handling this case um, otherwise the margin of error is very less in such patients ramesh sir any suggestions sir yeah i think that's all right i just want to give a lesson to or i don't know let's just want to tell the people because i have gone for 30 years in the different places and different places for ct scan and if they just about one second and the radiologist will say i'll do it in two seconds and one cut and all these things once you get into the problem i am sure there is nothing will be there in those ct scan room like what she said maybe very very i am really scared to be frank with you i'm scared to do any sedation or for a mri or a ct for a midazolam tumor it looks very good once you sedate what happens is the whatever the tumor on right side then it will just uh, fall down and collapse and suddenly the child will arrest you are, you don't know you don't have anything and then the ct scan room they may not even have oxygen believe me so uh, they will say uh, ambu bag may not be there proper laryngoscope may not be there so i think if you want really you need an expert at least to know the the plan and if you are not i have seen many of the junior most is sent for this ct scan room and then they'll give some perichloral then they say little midazolam then they'll say ketamine is okay so little ketamine then they get into problem they don't know so please do uh, any intensive is anybody going to ct scan or mri don't listen to all the radiologists because they will say they'll finish very fast but they'll get it then after that they'll say i want to give contrast so all the things is a big problem i think better to have a Uh, safe child and uh, till wait for someone else to come for a ct scan before uh, junior is sent for all these things so the bottom line uh, dr deepu is uh, see the the younger the child 
the difficult the greater the difficulty that is one point that people have to understand the uh, the anatomical and the physiological differences in children pose a significant um, airway difficulty um, uh, in itself uh, because um, uh, for various reasons like people would know that uh, um, their bmr is high their uh, uh, you know um, their uh, uh, respiratory muscles are like uh, uh, fatigue prone so they cannot really uh, sustain their own their apnea times are very low so all these things they have a inherent level of uh, complexity to a pediatric airway the um, the uh, the uh, the problems because of these congenital um, uh, abnormalities or whether it is tumor or anything pose an additional layer of complexity in these patients uh, which really um, increases the level of risk uh, you know many folds you cannot so it is very difficult to quantify so when you discuss the goals of uh, you know pediatric airway management um, you know we need to only stress few points is the one is to understand the factors that are um, causing these you know complexity that is one the second is you need to know what is the airway plan and a supraglottic airway device generally not for a mediastinal tumor but for any airway problems uh, remains a, a major major rescue rescue uh, device so you need to have uh, your airway plan uh, uh, ready and you need to plan for your failure also so you need to have a plan a plan b plan c you need to plan for your failure and then you need to have a the third aspect is you need to have a method of having an invasive airway access if you fail to oxygenate these patients so if you have a mediastinal tumor then again the cricothyrotomy and all are not really viable so you have to be very uh, you know uh, prudent when you are dealing with such uh, uh, such population uh, generally what uh, uh, most of the studies or most of the literature will tell you that um, you know if you struggle with intubations the more number of intubation attempts does cause uh, more uh, injuries um, and cardiac arrest is the most commonest airway related problem um, unfortunately so there is no you know room for error or there is no once you are having a, a airway disaster um, you know uh, there is no uh, the outcome is cardiac arrest and that is uh, that has to be a take home plan because uh, it is it is extremely extremely unacceptable morbidity that happens with airways so you need to have all these aspects pretty clear and pretty formulated you need to discuss you need to have the team everyone that is familiar around you need to have have an access who am i going to call for help if you if you have a problem so all these things have to be clear and loud discussed amongst the team before you take up anything for whether it's a diagnostic procedure or whether it is a therapeutic procedure okay thank you sir how did you manage sir how did you manage deepo sir how was this case managed uh, this case was from amruda sir actually they managed the aspiration of the cyst was done from ot then only intubated you could intubate before that i think that's another situation which i wanted to tell i think uh, you may try to do some non invasive method like ultrasound it's really i think i'm sure the chill field the ultrasound is really a nandi instead of getting a ct and an mri what are the best of ultrasound you can get it it's okay so go to the operating room go to ultrasound check you know where to aspirate in case there's a situation and then i think it's a cystic I, uh, you can also find out it's a solid or cystic it's a cystic it's very good but if cystic if it's going to be a bleed and it's an hemorrhagic cyst you are going to be getting into problem i think those things can be easily find out with the help of ultrasound and you say go to the operating room put something and see if there's any problem you must be able to uh, aspirate and put the tube the other thing very important if it is a solid if there's a problem the person who is uh, doing that i think the only way we can maintain the airway in a mediastinal tumor if it is solid he is put in a rigid bronchoscope beyond that uh, tumor so you keep the rigid bronchoscope put it beyond the tumor keep ventilating and then you can do whatever you want i think if you are not way you were not so all the mediastinal tumor cysts if it is cyst it's very simple you might be able to aspirate if it is going to be a little pus or something okay but if it's a soft 
the tumor most likely in one month baby they are usually they are not too bad so what you can do is you must do a rigid we have seen many of the i had some pictures i'll show you next time i had a tumor where suddenly no, when you give little sedation immediately all the muscles relax and collapse and obstruct the trachea now uh, tricheotomy or surgical or tracheostomy nothing is going to help and we are good it's a really very scary situations i think this is one of the very scary situations the mediastinal tumor coming for surgery or for diagnostic procedure see if at least for surgery they will agree but if they come for diagnostic and then we are losing it i don't think any other parents will agree that come right i think so it's a very uh, situation this child with the ultrasound is a very good one to do that even the sub if they want to do biopsy please suggest uh, do an ultrasound get biopsy than get a ct guide many of the ct people have told we we'll do a ct guide biopsy and i have told do i i don't think it's very safe to do a ct guide biopsy and uh, you can do an ultrasound and uh, most of the time the diagnosis has come with the ultrasound alone i think we must take the ultrasound you don't need lot of sedation or anything not like a ct scan okay thank you sir next case was a 6 month old baby is a, a case of cleft palate with small chin and brought with respiratory distress and saturation was not maintaining and chest x ray showed bronchopneumonia and uh, required intubation and the intubation was difficult and with anesthesia help only baby could be intubated in in such cases cleft lip and cleft palate anything uh, what 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 plan we can make so that intubation will be less cumbersome to remedy sir actually what you are talking about is a lip and palate with a small jaw it looks more like a um, uh, peer robin uh, syndrome yes. if i am not wrong yes, because sir. i think the peer robin syndrome is uh, the, the tongue is at the back getting obstructed with the cleft because of cleft palate and the jaw is not very well uh, developed so it will be micronathia that, that's the only objective method of finding a difficult area when a child is look at the jaw if the jaw is small that means it is very difficult because if you see the jaw is big there is a potential space where the tongue can be pushed into the potential space and you can intubate in the, what happens when the jaw is small like for example in a then the tongue will we don't no space to pull the top push the tongue and you may not be able to uh intubate i think this is in the case of peter robin and it is not um, it is uh, i'm not sure it's an emergency or a, i think it's a semi elective because the bronchopneumonia and the cleft lip and palate and then the respiratory distress i think uh, it's a fairly um, uh, uh, elective uh, semi elective i call semi emergency type of thing so what uh, uh, my uh, suggestion is that many of the pediatricians this is just uh, as soon as they see a cleft and palate and see a peer robin they say it's a very difficult intubation so once the uh, difficult intubation they mess around once there is a bleeding occurs that's all nothing could be done i think it's very important that particular time if possible like what uh, because being an anesthesiologist uh, i'll be happy to get, take the operating room give a inhalation which is much more easier but uh, i think if you don't have inhalational in the operating room you are going to do intubation i think that's a good idea to have an iv line definitely don't do awake intubations because if you do an awake intubation many of them without giving they think it's a difficult airway then they give an awake intubation they get into a lot of problems so i find that put in iv line is a very very important give a propofol see don't give so many drugs like metazolam and all that propofol is a very good drug because propofol if you give 1 mg per kilo what happens is that it is put it puts the child to sleep not only that it relaxes and also that it represses the laryngeal reflexes so what you do is put an iv line like what you give oxygen all the time this now the present i am sure intensivists are aware of all this uh, uh, thrive and high flow oxygen so just when you are doing all these things give an high flow oxygen to the nasal either if you have a thrive is okay or you can use a, a usual nasal cannula and give oxygen continuously and then give a good mask give little propofol so what we do is give little propofol don't give according to the dosage of 3 mg 4 mg give little less so give little less of propofol 1 mg per kilo and then with the mask put the mask and try to ventilate it's a very very important step once you are able to ventilate then all your problems are solved you all know that uh, putting a tube is not important oxygenating all the time is very important so once you know you can ventilate 
then i am relaxed so you are, if you are you can be able to ventilate some of the juniors what they do they keep on trying to put the tube put the tube when you can ventilate then bring it back then again just take your time what exactly you do much uh, okay the other option i i i do is you this is there for 25 years 30 years you took a two person silicon take in the left hand with the gloved uh, left hand and then go into the um, uh, this is a six months baby you can just under the tongue you just coat it and if you go put the index uh, index inside you can even see the epiglottis so just uh, put a little bit of xylacca uh, inside and then you do it come back and we ventilate a little bit then you are okay only thing is do not give it laxant at that particular time if you if you cannot ventilate so if you can ventilate all your problem solved but if you are not put an intubation do not give a muscle laxant i think that's a very important once you know what is a ventilate the next i want to put this put in a nasogastric tube this is a very very important at this particular level because if you are ventilating 30% goes to the lungs and 70% goes into the stomach and you know children are all epoxy is uh, low and they are all diaphragmatic breathers and there will become more hypoxia so you deflate the stomach and there's a vent for this and then you put in a um uh, then put a check laryngoscope first time do not take the tube out i do a take a laryngoscope and put nicely and see whether you are able to see the epiglottis okay as the epiglottis then you are i think about 70% is over because under the epiglottis there will be vocal cords so after that you just because with a small amount of propofol you will not be able to do a good laryngoscopy at least you will try laryngoscopy and see whether you're able to see the um, uh, epiglottis once you have seen the epiglottis then slowly go down and then you can do whatever uh, you are uh, whatever you want next you uh, whatever the laryngoscope you want to use it i feel that pilot has been told you do a straight blade for all children i think if you do a straight blade the blade is very narrow when you put it uh, in the straight blade then the both the tongue is too large it will come on the left side and also it will come on the right side you will be able to see sometimes you may able to see the glottis but you may not be able to put the tube i suggest at that particular time use a curved blade is a curved blade one is also available so take the curved blade and then push the tongue towards the left side see the what happens there in the in the laryngoscope that's called the flange that flange will go into the cleft lip on palate that that's a problem so when you do a cleft what you do go to the corner the left side corner of the mouth and try to use a curved blade push the tongue as much as possible and then uh, lift the tongue and it's okay the other important one then is at the, once you see the glottis you can spray a little bit with the tubosome silicon because you're not given a lot of uh, propofol i think if the propofol is good enough you just do that and then you can put your endotracheal tube but the endotracheal tube when you are putting go from the right side and then you have to put it in the not from the center go from the right side then put it in the tracheal tube the other trick we used to do is i have done this also when you put the laryngoscope you will see lot of tongue lot of tissues but you may not see where the vocal cord is ask somebody to push um, uh, press the uh, chest like a cardiac massage couple of you put a couple of uh, thing on the chest you can see the air bubble coming somewhere so that where the vocal cord is so that particular time you can put the tube i think this is a very important that the lesson for this is that if you can ventilate all problems is solved if you cannot ventilate don't keep on giving lot of sedation you call an expert to put it i think that's a, even an, an expert the difficult with the pure robin you may not have enough space to put the tube thank you sir dr shilpur dr dibu that uh, that was excellent uh, uh, from dr ramesh he may sound it very easy but uh, believe me it is not that easy and um, uh, the the point that um, from this case summary that i would want to say is see generally um, pier robin um, is is the condition which will get better with age this kid is a 6 month old with a cleft palate he has got a bronchopneumonia with an increased work of breathing and he is also desaturating so i don't think this is an ideal time to do the surgery for his cleft palate that is one the second is this is in in children the problem happens because Uh, now cleft now peer uh, you know if you have a cleft palate or cleft lip it is obvious but generally uh, children would have a smaller mandible the tongue would not fit into the 
you know, sub mental space, um, and all the routine airway evaluation scores do not really um, do not really hold true. If the kid is in the ICU for some reason, and you have to get the uh, airway in place. Uh, for some uh, you know procedural sedation or something of that sort not the cleft palate i'm saying i'm saying only uh, a, a, a patient who needs some sort of uh, airway uh, evaluation the routine airway evaluation does not uh, you know hold true like they do in adults whether you use the malam patti or the lemon or whatever uh, you know um, your uh, you know submental distance and things like that so that does not really work so what you need to um, uh, you know ask yourself when you are Uh, evaluating a patient for um, any a, a kid for a difficult airway is you need to have does this ask does this patient has got not for any general patient because um, uh, there is a varied uh, crowd who would uh, who would be listening to this so for airway evaluation in children you need to ask is there a potential difficult airway and you need to consider all children whether they are syndromic or non syndromic to have a potential difficult airway Uh, gen- most of the syndromes would have an airway component they may have a cardiac component or some other you know uh, syndrome related issue but most of the syndromes would have an airway component so if you uh, if you come across a syndromic child you should um, also uh, think of a potentially difficult airway uh, you see if there is a past history whether you somebody struggled with a difficult airway has mentioned um, there is a difficult airway look at the general appear- appearances whether you have got a receding mandible um, you've got a large occiput and all uh, you know syndromic fe- uh, feces whether you have a uh, uh, you know syndrome that you are dealing with then uh, as i said the uh, your routine scoring systems like malam patti would not be uh, very valid in in such cases uh, the question that you have to ask is will i be able to ventilate this patient uh, so whether and if i am not able to ventilate what will be my rescue ventilation strategy, strategy? like can a supraglottic airway be used um, that is the second question that you have to ask okay, will i be able to bag mask will i be able to intubate will i be able to bag mask if the answer is no you have to say what is the rescue strategy if i am not able to bag mask then will i be able to put a supraglottic airway in yeah. and the answer has to be very very clear if you are not able to get a supraglottic airway in you should be able to have a plan for your front of neck access um, in kids it is extremely difficult to have a front of neck access in an emergency uh, it is anyways difficult in adults Uh, in kids in a panic situation where where your adrenaline is off the roof it is extremely difficult to locate where the cricothyroid membrane is and to get a definitive um, you know airway access so you need to have all those questions very very well answered before you take up a syndromic child for either a definitive procedure or a diagnostic procedure or anything that can compromise the airway like for uh, i think shilpa told about uh... Uh, supraglottic airways i forgot about that i think it's very important next step of uh, is you must have a proper size lma see because the people are uh, as you can understand it shelf uh, many of the intensivists may not be aware of the supraglottic airway devices there are many supraglottic airway devices for example an lma or with the eye jowl and uh, different things i'll prefer at least there are uh, for the benefit of the people there are many uh, there's a first generation supraglottic airways that is called as a classic lma then the second is a second generation supraglottic that is called a prosil lma the third generation is now you forget at least for the present i recommend and i also feel that if you want to use an lma in a small babies please use a second generation first generation lma that is a classic lma is out i think it should be banned because this second generation either a one size uh, prosil lma will sit nicely because it's a two cup nicely it will sit not only that it has gone another one especially in a child when you mask when play the stomach gets filled up the nephrosis will become more hypoxic or to deflate so if you want to rescue device the second rescue device you must have probably is the only one is the one size because it's available as 1 2 2.1.5 1.5 but in a 6 months baby you can read 1 to 1.5 but you must have one size second generation that is called a prosil lma or igel i have no experience igel but that is also quite okay you have a prosil lma number 1 
and if it is a 1 2 to 2.5 kilo the only one manufacturer is having is rq has got 0.5 so only rq has got a 0.5 where you can use about 2 to 3 kilo babies but beyond that you should use only one size prosil lma because it will not slip it will be okay it will not rotate and you can deflate the stomach I think this is very important for all the people that the classic LMA is okay for the para, um, paramedical probably to resuscitate on the roadside. But if you want clinically, I still feel that I may be very harsh, but I can tell you that you must use only prosil LMA. If you don't prosil, the problem with the prosil LMA is the classic LMA, you can get all uh, 600 to 700 rupees. Prosil LMA, the original oil costs about 13,000 to 15,000 rupees. But I feel that it's a reusable, you can do that. If you are in an institution, I think you can use it. But IGEL is cheaper. There's one called IGEL. IGEL is also cheaper, available as one size. You can put IGEL also to do it. So if you want to use those type of airway, have all the equipment level by your side. But if you don't use it, it's well and good. If you use it, you will save the child. I think that's what the situation is. And for the benefit of the audience, no, you have to have one, uh, one LMA that you are used to. Like don't try to, yeah, don't try to do a, a novice technique when you are uh, struggling with a uh, difficult airway. You use the technique that you are used to, use the LMA that you are used to, um, and that should uh, work when you are facing with a difficulty. Thank you, sir. So take from is in cleftip and cleft palate and Pierre Robin uh, cases like that with small chin, we should always have an airway plan with the use of supraglottic airway if required, and also use of small sedation with the proper for low dose and see whether we can ventilate and also spray of silocaine spray also will be helpful in those cases. And we'll go to next case. And this is a nine-year-old, this case was from Calicut Mims, shared by Dr. Satish. Nine-year-old boy was a uh, Morchios phenotype, that is mucopolysaccharidosis presented with severe respiratory distress and chest X-ray was showing severe pneumonia and the intubation trials failed and cellular anterior placed las larynx and it was intubated from OT. This is a representative picture only of this child. So in uh, like syndromic cases like uh, this is a bell-shaped chest with multiple bony abnormalities. How we can go ahead if child is presenting in an emergency to Dr. Shilshud? Okay, so, mm, so clearly, I mean, uh, if you are dealing with a syndromic child, I mean, with the uh, uh, with the um, you know risk of uh, being repetitive, I would still feel that uh, you should um, have your uh, airway plans ready. Uh, if you are now in this case, generally, if you are dealing with a difficult airway, uh, uh, you can use uh, your video laryngoscope as the primary uh, you know device for intubation uh, of course thinking that you need to have a backup for ventilation whether uh, it can be a difficult bag mask ventilation or uh, if you are struggling with it you need to have a, a rescue ventilation device that is the um, lma and of course you always as i said the question that you have to ask is how will i uh, get into a um, definitive airway uh, front of neck access if i'm not able to oxygenate this patient or i have a complete ventilation failure whatever you can uh, define so when you are preparing for a um, like uh, so in, in generally um, if you are uh, if you have a, a syndromic patient uh, coming for some procedure um, you can um, look it up and see what are the components of um, you know, um, uh, complexities in a particular syndrome and you can deal with it. But when you say mucopolysaccharidosis, um, the issue generally is they get worse uh, after vaccines. Uh, and uh, you have to be extremely careful when you use muscle relaxant in these kids, especially uh, if you are struggling with, um, you know, ventilating in these patients. So I would stay away from uh, muscle relaxant. That is one. Uh, but uh, if you ask me a general approach, uh, if I am dealing with a, um, you know, difficult airway, I would ask, uh, myself, you know, whether you know this procedure um, uh, is elective or urgent, or you know, uh, uh, I need to um, you know optimize him. What is in the event of an airway failure? What is the alternative plan? A plan B, plan C? All those uh, 
things again um, i would think that do i need a um, you know airway evaluation whether in terms of ct scan or uh, radiology or ultrasound um, uh, generally uh, i use ultrasound to locate the cricothyroid membrane um, uh, because in kids it becomes even extremely difficult and if we are dealing with a um, you know connective tissue disorder then it may be even more difficult so um, i would generally look at the uh, cricothyroid membrane mark it if uh, if uh, need be then um, i would think that you know can the airway be um, you know optimized any further like uh, 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 before i give anesthesia uh, and then oh, is there a plan like will i be able to wake up this kid if i am not able to you know uh, get the airway definitively will i be able to wake up or like i don't want to burn my bridges when i am uh, going for anesthesia or you know sedation um uh, that's uh, one question that i would always ask myself um the other question is if i'm not going to use relaxant how, can i keep the airway patent either by bag mask or by uh, supraglottic or uh, you know or i get the definitive intubation uh, while the patient is breathing spontaneously uh, is is another question uh, sometimes i would also ask should i have a, a surgical airway um as a primary mode of uh, uh, you know air securing the airway um those are the questions uh, that we have to ask if you are uh, looking at upfront anticipated difficult uh, uh, airway you can even think of doing an upfront fiber optic um, by you know small sedation with uh, thrive um, uh, where you continuously oxygenate and pay, keep the patient uh, uh, you know spontaneously breathing and uh, uh, get the thrive if for a, for some reason if you are uh, if you are not able to um, if you have to ventilate the patient if you struggle to ventilate you have to get in a subglottic airway device you should also have a plan how to how will i get a, get in a tube in 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 these patients uh, in and uh, you can um, there are various ways you can do a uh, uh, you can do a um, intubation through the subglottic airway device uh, or you can also have intubating lmas uh, but generally what we do is uh, if you are um if you have a supraglottic in place and uh, so for example if the intubation has been difficult and you've got a supraglottic in place and you want to intubate through the supraglottic airway you can use a, a tube exchanger over a small uh, you know 2.8 uh, mm fiber optic uh, and get the tube over the uh, over the uh, airway exchange catheter uh, or uh, in in generally uh, bigger uh, kids or uh, or adults we can use an entry exchange catheter also but a normal uh, tube exchanger Uh, uh would also uh, sit on the bronchoscope so whatever uh, uh, exchange catheter you can fit over a small pediatric bronchoscope um, and of course the bronchoscope should accept uh, the supraglottic airway should be able to accept the uh, bronchoscope so all these questions have to be answered when you actually deal with a known uh, difficult airway uh, situation thank you sir ramesh sir any suggestion sir ramesh sir sir you are mute ramesh sir you are ramesh sir you are mute we are not able to hear you Doctor Ramesh, you are muted. Yeah, yeah. Did, did this child come for I from the intensive care? Yes, sir. Child presented with the respiratory distress to emergency. I tell you, the uh, one of the probably whatever uh, I found in this um, uh, in this about thirty years of my uh, practice, both in the ICU as well as in the anesthesia. i think if you say the probably the first uh, for most difficult airway in a child will be the mucopolysaccharidosis it is a really frightening situations and uh, it's a very sad but uh, i feel that i can give you so many pictures we have we have got a center for mucopolysaccharidosis where do all this thing the problem i just want to tell you is that it is not exactly the problem as many for example the um, head will be very large and a lot of mucopolysaccharidosis situations uh, tissues will be in the nasal and also around the glottis and uh, all over the mouth and uh, very difficult to mask ventilate and it's uh, really old the third point is that the cervical the atlanta cervical spine uh, this one will be very uh, dislocated or it will be very very unstable 
if you do extend too much then they i have seen the paraplegia or quadriplegia happening in this particular uh, child so all the things have, and also if the mucopolysaccharide is operated and they made a hardware and it has been uh, already the wiring has been done and all this is stabilized by all this um, hardware you cannot extend you cannot put a tube one of the most difficult and not only that these children will have many congenital problem like cardiac problem already operated or there will be a bp shunt done already so if the child i uh, basically uh, many of the time if the child mucopolysaccharides come to the uh, icu as soon as they come they are little mild as well they call me and tell me so there is a child just come to icu there is see i feel as a surgeon as an anesthesiologist the only skill which anesthesiologist score of every every other people is the airway so there is no harm in calling an anesthesiologist to do that uh, before informing so i know there is a child which has been admitted to icu and this child is going to be difficult so they inform me already so i know this is going to be tough then i already have a plan what to do so i prayed god that this child should be at least niv or i flow the child should recover much because if you intubate and then already the chest volume will be very less and then you ventilate it's a really very difficult for the child to come out of the ventilation many of them they got used to it they got see, and then you know the prognosis of mucopolysaccharides is not very good so when you can uh, in a hospital ventilate for about 15 days and so much money they have lost and we have a lot of problems i my feeling is that as much as possible try to postpone the intubation in an icu for any of the possible i am sure you have got so many methods right now please try to postpone if that is the one, not the one i think even anesthesiologists are very very difficult unless they have treated this type of patients they think very simple but they for sometimes there's so much difficulty even if you want to put an lma in the child they or because all the tissues and the epiglottis will fall down even putting an lma and seating is very very difficult so if this child comes what sometimes what i do is when the child is awake sedated i do a fibrotic uh, bronchoscope in the icu so that i'll see whether the, i am able to see the glottis there is no nasal tissues is obstructing whether i will be able to put the tube now i am happy that i'll be able to do the intubations i think video laryngoscopy might help but with the video laryngoscopy is very difficult to insert the tube i think the other option is a fibrotic intubation is the best without any problem so i i make sure i'll go there do a fibrotic and see whether i am able to do it then it is in my mind if there is an emergency we go and intubate i don't know how they have intubated the child but i think fibrotic is the cho- um, uh, equipment of choice if you are an expert in that for that you must be a good in putting a fibrotic intubation in normal patients and difficult patients because in mucopolysaccharosis all lot of tissues will be all be uh, there will be very difficult to put it down okay sir thank you Anything from the audience want to tell anything about this? Who have done this case? Is somebody is there? Doctor Satish from NIMS. Okay, okay, okay. That is they had a respiratory failure. They ventilated, is it? Yes, they ventilated. They ventilated. Okay. Doctor, can I? Yeah, ah, yeah, ask Doctor Satish. Hello. Yeah, you are audible, yes. sir. Yeah, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. ஹோவரிங் <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and it was around some two o'clock in the night also. So we didn't have the senior consultant anesthetist around. We would call the uh, resident anesthetist who was there. So by the time the child uh, he had arrived before the child started crashing, so I had to try one intubation. But then I was not able to visualize. So I waited for him to come. Uh, but then um, they didn't have a bronchoscope at that point of time for some reason, and then they had to get a video laryngoscope. It took some time for it to come also. and in the mean, meanwhile uh, the the anesthetist who was there the resident anesthetist was there he tried intubating it was not possible then even with video laryngoscope it was not possible and we had to bag intermittently 
he was on high flow oxygen through the nose but still he was desaturating so it was as you said it was a very 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 uh, tense uh, say somewhere around half an hour to one hour with all the pp and other things too and ultimately it was he was intubated after uh, multiple trials with the vidura ring he went home after about 3 3 months of stay on a tracheostomy okay good you did a tracheostomy i think that's a finally it will lead on to tracheostomy for these children i think that's okay there's a one uh, small trick uh, i don't know whoever is there uh i have one equipment say i feel that if the uh, one equipment everyone should know very cheap is a cook uh, uh, fova intubating catheter that's called as a j tip is slightly uh, turned towards a little about 10 15 degrees that's a j tip cook cooks fova intubating catheter i think that cost little i about 3000 to 4000 rupees but i think when you see a little bit of a uh, vocal cord because in uh, mycopathy you may not be able to see everything you will see the epiglottis and beyond that you may not be able to see so you put this cook uh, cook intubation catheter comes a 8 8 french and 14 french and you take 8 french and 8 french will go into 3.5 also so if this a child is big you can give a 12 14 french and then you, you just put the endotracheal uh, put the cooks intubating catheter once you put the intubating catheter you can even verify with the etco2 it is inside you can oxygen through that over that you can put the endotracheal tube because the endotracheal tube is not really so curved in such a way in a difficulty you can pass i think if you have i think you must all uh, uh, buy one intubate it's uh, really very handy in a small children 8 french and 14 french you must have because if there is a problem i think the if you can't put the tube put the cooks intubating four hour catheter and then over it thread the endotracheal tube that is the best available okay thank you sir next case uh, this case has uh, uh, came to our nearby hospital this was a 10 year old obese boy with 60 kg presented with fever omitting and issue of fever omitting and lethargy and child was unresponsive at admission to emergency and was in shock and there was guarding in the abdomen was intubated with anesthesia help with emergency department because of the obesity and following the shock was carted to fluid bolus and inotropic support and required later lapros- laparotomy for perforation peritonitis so in obese child how will go ahead sir to remesh sir yeah obese child see if you see the obese child for all the people i don't know it's, it looks very scary i had the pictures when you have about um, it's uh, when obese child is very very scary but uh, what is important is that to, uh, to do too much of sedation they get obstructed like what any time if you are a difficulty i think the best option many of them they feel that i don't know how many they feel that ketamine is very safe and midazolam is very safe dexmed is safe they keep all the drug give little 1 mg 2 mg midazolam then little bit of ketamine then they give little bit of dexmed and they don't use propofol see for uh, some reasons i think the propofol is a good drug Uh, because it is though the half life is uh, short some of the metabolites for long life but at least it will depress the little bit of respiration and then we will able to do a laryngoscope even with the midazolam or a dexmed or ketamine you cannot do a laryngoscope because the child will have a lot of laryngospasm and all this i think that's a good to use a little bit of propofol so you are able to mask ventilate i think the important thing in obese patient please i think the you may not be able to mask ventilate but you may be able to intubate please remember this because if you don't difficult mask ventilation don't uh, worry you put in a laryngoscope you will able to see the vocal cords and you can intubate intubation in a obesity obese patient is not very difficult but mask ventilation in this particular mask ventilation in obese child is very very difficult so in case you are ventilating you are not able to ventilate with the mask don't uh, leave it put in a laryngoscope spray the vocal cords with 2% salicylic then shower in the tube you may not be able to give a relaxation because uh, you are all not trained like an anesthesiologist i feel that as soon as propofol most of the time in uh, other parts of the world that they don't give a muscle relax at all for intubation even for anesthesia they give propofol little bit of cefluorine and then spray the cords put in the tube so the lesson in obese patient don't get scared is really scaring but what happens is that 
you if you put a non cup tube in obese patient then you give a lot of pressure it will leak around so in this obese patients try to put a cuff tube so that you can have high pressure you can ventilate better in a obese patient this child you are putting because of respiratory failure respiratory distress or ards you need a good cuff tube so that you can ventilate much better in that so the and then you give a little head up position because that will give you a little bit of a head up position and continuously give oxygen like what i think that will become a norm these days those days we have pre oxygenation during intubation we don't give uh, oxygen now it is what is called a continuous oxygenation so you put in nasal i'm sure your intensivists are uh, very used to this so you give oxygenate through the nasal cannula whatever the mode you want to give that's okay you can use your um, i flow or you can use your tri or you must give continuous oxygen so that you may not desaturate see once desaturate you become tensed up and suddenly you come back and try to mask ventilate which mask ventilate may not be possible so in obese situation also you see something you put in a fova intubating catheter over it through the endotracheal tube you can put a smaller endotracheal tube but you put a cuff tube you put a smaller endotracheal tube non cuff then you may not be able to ventilate so in case you put another option is i want to tell you other thing is that if you have put in a smaller tube and you are scared to take out the tube and put in a bigger tube that is what is called the tube exchange catheter by the cooks so you see i feel that what are the five things you need to have a difficult airway management one is a fibroptic laryngoscope which is the gold standard if you can't see anything video laryngoscope is the gold standard if you can see but you cannot intubate best is a cooks any uh, cooks for uh, intubating catheter you you put the tube and the extubation is going to be difficult and you want to exchange i think the cooks airway exchange catheter i think these are all the four thing you need to have it in difficult airway you don't need all the, i think if you see the um, google and the lectures there's a plenty or more for uh, devices available <coughs> you have all the four i think more or less it's okay but the lesson is that whenever you do anything please do see what to monitor i think do not believe anything on auscultation the tube is inside tube is outside and all these things the, i am sure you are all aware this is because i am i know i am going taking little extra time but it is you all aware whenever we talk about airway these days that is called the nap4 airway management in the uk where they did lot of work on the airway problems and they found in uk that 30 to 40 percent problems are because in anesthesia pediatric icu pediatric anesthesia all because they did not have etcvo2 or even if they have etcvo2 they don't know how to use etcvo2 this is not this is done about 4 to 5 years ago i think any difficult airway confirmation is 100 percent with etcvo2 not by auscultation Yeah. Thank you, sir, Doctor Shilpush. Yeah, so this is yeah, this is a a classic uh, uh, ICU case which you know which is more often than not heads into a disaster. You know, this is a patient who's in um, a septic shock um, and severely acidotic who comes to the ICU. Um, it, he may generally come in the wee hours of the night or very after hours, uh, where you know the expertise is uh, is. not uh, to the optimum uh, given the nature of the icus that we have around um, and um, you know because the consultant is not there the junior most colleague is uh, on duty and the sickest patient comes during that time uh, and it is a you know as i said recipe for disaster the the, the thing is what you need to know uh, this is for all all our um, you know junior colleagues is um the patient generally is very acidotic he is very tachypneic to maintain the ph his ph is roughly around 7.2 or maybe 7.1 his co2 is hovering anywhere between 20 and um, what happens is whether you use ketamine whether you use any sort of uh, induction agents you do not match his ventilatory um, you know uh, you know requirement and his if you don't he is breathing at 40 or he is breathing at 35 and once you give the drug you don't ventilate him at the rate of 30 35 what happens is immediately the co2 builds from you know 20 to 30 or 40 and there is a drop in ph to 7 and you have a recipe for cardiac arrest 
so this is very common we see that uh, patients do arrest uh, during the intubation time just after induction of course the 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 sympathetic drive is gone um, and that is a major contributor for uh, hemodynamic instability but the bigger contribution also is uh, because we do not match up to the uh, you know the uh, the compensatory mechanism that the body are body is doing and that's why um, you know uh, the ph drops and you get uh, cardiac arrest during intubation uh, just dr uh, ramesh mentioned about etco2 i suggest everyone should you know follow the um, the jabber or the monpiler uh, intubation bundles that is uh, in in the icu so you need to have two operators that is one so you need to have two operators you need to have fluid loading um, before you intubate you need to have a uh, vasopressor drawn and hooked up into the line um, before you give induction drugs then during intubations as i said you need to have the skilled operator doing the intubation there has to be the other person um, who would be doing the required pressure most importantly like the nap for audit which dr ramesh mentioned um, the the lack of uh, tube confirmation with end tidal capnography and that to waveform capnography is extremely extremely important uh, which is not followed in most of the icus and that's the reason why you're not sure whether the tube, tube is in uh, you would insufflate the stomach you desaturate you aspirate and you know these events are not recorded because uh, we feel that the kid was very very sick when he came to us and he collapsed on us but there were contributing factors which led to the kid um, not having um, you know optimum care during uh, during intubation intubation is a extremely high risk procedure make no mistake uh, you need to have skilled people who are aware of the physiological derangements and who are up to the, for the task and of course um, you know there are other components like you secure the tube you um, you, you um, uh, use low tidal volume ventilations and things and uh, so forth but um, you know peri intubation people have to be extremely extremely vigilant um, about uh, um, uh, you know how to do intubation during the uh, during icu you pre oxygenate with uh, uh, on a ventilator with a peep and pressure spot uh, uh, is again uh, important because we know that their oxygenation reserves are very poor Uh, they do not improve their oxygenation even if adequately pre-oxygenated. So you need to oxygenate them on a ventilator. That is again important. If you have a full stomach, you need to aspirate the stomach. You can do an ultrasound and check what is the gastric residual volume to see what is the risk of aspiration. If these kids, like you mentioned, this kid who's got a um, you know a guarding and acute abdomen, he may be having um, uh, you know. Um, Uh, uh, full stomach, and he's a potential risk for aspiration. You need to aspirate um, the stomach and make sure that your uh, stomach is empty before you um, give him the induction uh, medications. In spite of having gastric aspiration, you need to, um, you know, whether the merit of using a required pressure is uh, is there or not with in literature. But you still uh, are favored to have required pressure in the ICU intubations, at least if not in um, in anesthesia or um, ORs. Yeah. Deepo, just a small. Um, I think he has brought in. I'm sure you're all aware of intensivists. I know because I'm with the intensivists also. I think he has uh, brought out. Uh, I think he still has brought out an important concept of this uh, physiologically difficult. Era. I'm sure every concept is what he is talking about. That I, I, when we were trained, we just want to put the tube, whatever the drugs. Now we are thinking of different aspects. of what is called the physiologically difficult airway i'm sure you're all been there a lot of talks you would have heard about it gross when you are giving a drugs and intubating think of that physiological variations like you know hypotension or hypertension or arrhythmia or shock or acidosis i think all these things should be keep in mind i'm sure you are all aware that that's a different between your airway management in the theater and airway management. i see you the concept of uh, physiologically difficult airway so i just want the people who are listening please have a concept of physiology i'm sure you are all aware so please give because you may give proper fall that it will definitely there will be a lot of uh, blood pressure is already shock you must be very careful in giving it try to combine with somebody who it can increase for your inotropes you would create increase it and give a little barikai all the things should be available to resuscitation when you are doing an intubation so it is not only the airway but i think airway in a physical physiological difficult airway is going to be a little more uh, difficult i think already difficult anatomical difficult airway along with physiological difficult airway it's a really tough job i think it's you must uh, the concept i'm sure uh, shilpa has put into it i'm sure you are all aware of that 
it is one thing to intubate in a you know well saturated uh, child um, but it is a completely different ball game when you are trying to get an airway when the kid is desaturating when your heart rate and your adrenaline is over the roof um uh, you know uh, there is no algorithm at that time uh, you uh, you are also so stressed out that you just uh, try to uh, you know get the tube in um and uh, like i previously mentioned more than two attempts is a recipe for disaster most of the cardiac arrest do have in fact a uh, lot of literature does say that you have to limit your intubation attempts to less than two so uh, when you say that you have to limit your intubation attempts to less than two that means you are letting only the experts to try at intubations uh, which is not the case in intensive care unit intensive care unit generally the the junior most colleague is handed over the task of intubating those patients um, which is very very counterintuitive for my understanding you know uh, when those are the sickest of patients who are actually handling the airway okay thank you sir and uh, sir are you able to share your cases no no not sorry i have not <laughs> i don't have a case but i am not sure whether uh, i am not able to hear something but let me see whether i can show you i am on the laptop i can show you one or two cases or one, at least one case which is maybe difficult i'll, I'll just put a picture whether we able to uh, do something which is okay with that let me check whether i have any other uh, case which is okay with that okay we can take a couple of questions uh, dr deepu if uh, yeah 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 audience has got uh, questions also the questions anybody wants to do is i think that's okay i'll share something which is i it's difficult right now uh, any questions nothing in the chat chat box i have seen are you able to see this ones yes sir yeah yes sir this is what i'm talking about uh, mucopolysaccharidosis and uh, this child coming with uh, the heart van is going to be very difficult i think i next time i'll share some of the problems but uh, i think it's already time and we'll uh, see you your one more case i think no 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 sir yes sir over okay yeah. i think we are already time but sorry i couldn't share my this one and whether your time you can talk about uh, i want to lecture uh, shil i think uh, we'll take few questions sir because um, uh, that would be more interesting rather than the lecture yeah yeah, yeah. I, it's better, already time yeah, okay. yeah it's already 9 o'clock any questions please okay there's no question i just want to give a small advice for the people that's what we follow whether you take an advice or suggestion it is your uh, uh, choice i feel that see i've been told by many people long time ago and even a pediatric intensivist that anesthesiologist take care of a normal children intensivist take care of a sick children so people should be really experienced in the anesthesia so that they can take care of the sick children so this has been very clearly as we told unless you know how to ventilate a normal lung how can you ventilate a diseased lung unless you are an expert in a normal airway how can you manage a difficult airway i think most of the airways coming in the icu is are either physiological difficult airway or something so i think that during the part of the training i don't know how much is a part of part of the training i feel that at least about i feel that because in our hospital they post for, for about a month but i think one month is fairly good enough i think if you can for three if you have a three years i think if you have three years course two months should be posted in the pediatric anesthesia two months in that so that they are well versed with the drugs well versed with the airway well versed with all the equipments which are there and they do very well i have seen the people who have been posted here going that they are not expert at least they are all aware of what they are uh, doing at least 15 days to one month if it is a one year course i think the most of your uh, fellowship course have been made as two years i think except for your own hospitals one year if it is a one year course make it as about one month is good enough if it is two to two years i think two months can be put in the anesthesia because whatever you are doing in anesthesia you are all doing in the icu in a sick patient that's all 
So what do you put there? You can maintain the airway. You know what they're doing. Drugs, they do it very frequently. I think I know all the people who have been there. They're quite happy. In, uh, they don't call the anesthesia posting. They call it an airway posting. So some of them, they, they come into bed and then they'll go. I told if you want to do everything, please there for all the, the whole day. See, most of them, they want only put a tube, put an LMA, and uh, they're happy to get trained. I don't. I want to train them in anesthesia for about 15 to 20, uh, one month. Then only things will be all right. This is just a suggestion. I heard from other people also. The people have come to anesthesia posting are doing much better. I uh, Can I talk? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Chat, chat box, two but questions. I, uh, Oh, okay, Dr. Raj. Uh, my name is Dr. Raj. I'm one of the uh, intensivists. I completely agree with you uh, about uh, what you told. Uh, we all as pediatricians, we really learned our airway skills from neonatology and try to adapt it to the older children, which doesn't fit in, you very well know. And uh, uh, the need for anesthetic training during our uh, intensive care training is very much needed. I don't think there is a dedicated training period in our curriculum. Uh, but I would request all of you who are newly qualified people to go to theater, talk to your senior anesthetist, stand. As, as Sir told, putting the tube down is only a part of it. I think what is the most important thing is to stand there and watch how a senior anesthetist prepared to intubate, talking about, understanding the airway, preparing the drugs, talking to the team. So all these things is something we should learn very young and then carry it on through our practices. It is really going to help the children you treat and as a very valid suggestion, sir, I think uh, this has to come to our intensive care society at the national level, uh, at the forums, and then I hope there should be positive movement on that. Thanks for bringing it up, sir. I think that's, a, see, if you take the period intensive care, I know the first one I started in somewhere in 1991 in Chennai with uh, about 40 people, 50 people, now about uh, so many intensivists all, all over. And wherever there's a pediatric intensive care, their pediatric anesthesia will be good. I'm telling because if they have a pediatric intensive care, that means their input for pediatric anesthesia also there. Even if it is not much, at least two to three cases per day, and having the uh, feel of the mask, feel of the circuit, feel of everything, monitoring, uh, I think that makes all the difference. Not because I'm an anesthesiologist, I'm telling you, but I think that's what, like, for example, for years told, we have been a lot of things have been transferred from neonatology to here, and they use a straight blade. If there's a problem with the third blade, they ask for a straight blade and they will mess around. I think because they've been taught the pediatricians, the straight blade is the best to intubate, and that has been there for uh, the older child also. So I think that concepts are all, not that I'm against the people, and I'm not talking against the neonatologist. This is, I'm talking from my knowledge, talking the books, and talking, I know that works well. So I think this is very important. Small, small things are where I have seen them and I said, okay, I think they should be also there. Similarly, in all other, other places, pediatric anesthesia fellowships, you should be posted one month in the intensive care also. So it is not that they should be posted here. I think we all should also be posted here in the post-op how we should take care. I think that's all uh, uh, pediatric anesthesia and pediatric uh, uh, intensive care is more or less, I think they should be in a uh, uh, good uh, term so that they can be trained much better. People who are, I have gone, they were trained for one month, they've gone. I tell them, if you have free time, please come and work in anesthesia so that you'll be okay. So the only difference you will make from the other uh, intensive is that if there's a little difficult problem, they'll call you and put a tube and you make the difference. I think that's more important than that. So we have a few questions in chat box. Uh, one is by Dr. Sadiq. Which are the best medications for RSI? Dr. Uh, Ramesh, sir. RSI. See, yes, sir. Uh, see, as uh, Shilp was said, that I, I can't really give a blanket drugs because the thing is that I can't give a blanket drugs. See, if this is called as a, actually this is slightly there is a, um, a little bit of a modification of pediatric anesthesia because RSI terminology is almost gone. But if you in, still in uh, critical care, it's still there. Because you pre-oxygenate, because in a, what is the typical RSI is that you pre-oxygenate and then you don't give a ventilate, then you give a muscle relaxants, then you give, don't ventilate, put the tube as much as possible. That was the typical RSI. Now there are situations called modify RSI where you can give continuous oxygen even during intubation 
or you can use light ventilation. That's called modify RSI. But for RSI, depends on whether you are dealing with a healthy child, good hemodynamics, or it is a sick child with a very bad shock. See, if the shock, BP is low, I think there is no question. Of, you just have to give whatever the drug, like a, probably a little bit of ketamine, because that time ketamine will be a little bit, raise the blood pressure a bit, and then you can give a little medazolam, then the muscle relax and put a tube inside the cuff. If it is, everything is all right. If everything is all right, hemodynamic is stable, the best will be, the best will be propofol. If you give propofol, and then you can give muscle relaxants. The question comes, which muscle relaxants? The drug of choice, I think, is succamethonium. Because succamethonium, the drug of the relaxation, none of the relaxant has come to the league of succamethonium. If you don't have a succamethonium and you are not happy and you are not, not because nowadays almost succamethonium, people are not used to do succamethonium. So the best drug probably, if you, the airway is good, see if the airway is good, the best, second best drug is rocuronium. Rocuronium is a good drug because a good relaxant you can interpret. If you are using vecuronium or tricorium and if you are able to ventilate, airway is good. You want the onset should be shorter because atricorium and vecuronium will take about two to three minutes. You want within a minute to act, please give one and a half times the dosage of the drug. Your onset time can be fast and then you can put the tube. But please believe me, you must be an expert when you do a muscle relaxant and there should not be any, any difficult airway during that particular time. I think propofol with the muscle relaxant is good enough. But remember, there are three situations can arise. Intracranial tension patient, is it hypoxia and hypotension or a normal patient. Normal patient, whatever you want, you use it. If it is intracranial pressure, you should be nicely sedated, not top sedated, pressure will go up. And succamethonium is not a good choice because it's supposed to be vasc um, uh, fasciculation cause of ICT. You can use other drugs. And uh, if it is a uh, low pressure, the drug of choice is the ketamine and muscle relaxant. Ketamine will increase the pressure a little bit. So it, you cannot give a blanket drugs, but you can use according to the particular situation, that particular patient. Another question is, in case of tracheitis or epiglottitis, any precaution for intubation? Dr. Shil. Yeah, so, um, so for all, whether it is um, uh, epiglottitis or tracheitis or, um, uh, you know, uh, laryngitis, um, you need to have adequate uh, depth of anesthesia. That's, so, that's one thing that you need to maintain. Um, whether, uh, when you're dealing with an epiglottitis, it's a different, then you're dealing with a difficult airway. Um, then you need to be sure whether you will be able to lift the epiglottis when you're uh, trying to intubate those patients. Then um, in such cases, uh, you need to be sure about what is your uh, primary, uh, you know, uh, uh, laryngoscope of uh, choice that you're going to use. Whether your um, video laryngoscope does make things very easy. Uh, yeah, once you see the glottis, um, it, your nerves would settle. Um, it uh, it is uh, you know uh, uh, I'm sure you must have read the article on video laryngoscope where it says seeing is not uh, believing. So it uh, you though you see the glottis, uh, it, it is sometimes difficult to get the tube in. Uh, but still, uh, uh, as I said, uh, once you see the glottis, you are less. Um, stressed about uh, getting the tube in. You may struggle to get the tube in, but uh, uh, you know the stress factor is far, far less and the success rate may go up. Uh, though the intubation times may be a little more uh, uh, as compared to your conventional scopes that you use. Okay, and to sorry. add to the rapid sequence inductions, um, you know, when you say rapid sequence, you are committing to a dose of, uh, you're not using titrated medications. So you have a, you are committed to a dose. Uh, so you need to choose the drug. You need to choose the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the muscle relaxant of choice. And, uh, you know, as I said, SUX is still the most commonly used for rapid sequence induction. Uh, when you can use delayed sequence in induction in uh, intensive care uh, patients where you wait till your saturations get better um, and you can uh, bag a little bit while you maintain your required pressure. Uh, but those are modifications. As I said, uh, when you choose the drug, uh, whether it is ketamine, uh, which you think that probably is quite safe for rapid sequence induction, uh, in patients who are adrenergically exhausted, uh, patients who are in shock where you think that maybe ketamine is safe. In those patients also, uh, you have to uh, remember that it can be a myocardial depressant, um, uh, though cough, 
contrary to the belief that it would cause uh, you know uh, improvement in the blood pressure so you have to be careful about ketamine when the patient is adrenergically exhausted it can cause myocardial depression uh, thank you sir one more question kindly share your experiences on pediatric cricothyroidotomy so um uh, cricothyroidotomy is something that um, everybody has to um, has to be familiar with um, uh, you know if you practice long enough uh, i'm sure um, you know i'm afraid that you might come across cases where you might have to um, you know do a uh, emergency front of neck access and cricothyroidotomy is the only uh, you know recommended uh, uh, you know front of neck access even in pediatric population though uh, from the nap for audit we know that uh, you know anesthetists are not very good in in doing uh, cricothyroidotomy uh, the 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 success rate was uh, hardly 40% uh, whereas when, when the surgeons did cricothyroidotomy the success was really um, uh, near to 100% and that tells us that um, because we are uh, uh, have the ownership of the airway probably the stress factor does make us make mistake and not look at the cricothyroidotomy Uh, very well uh, when the surgeons were able to do it uh, pretty well that is one aspect the second is um, in pediatric population cricothyroidotomy um, uh, is largely debated because uh, people think tracheostomy to be the uh, primary difficult uh, uh, definitive airway as a rescue but still um, uh, literature is pretty uh, clear that you need to do a cricothyroidotomy if you are uh, having a complete ventilation failure or a cvc is like situation in that case you need to know what is the instrument because getting the needle and the um, you know catheter into the cricothyroid membrane is is one thing and then uh, how to ventilate is another thing so you need to be familiar about those things and you can only get familiar by doing it in mannequins or doing it on, on pigs like in western population people practice on pig tracheas or goat tracheas and um, and uh, try to keep up with their skills uh, having said that um, for younger uh, kids you can use an 18 gauge catheter um, you know generally um, uh, generally uh, you know clinicians are more comfortable with a selinger technique and that's why the needle catheter technique is still um, uh, still uh, uh, accepted by the uh, by the guidelines though as i said das does say scalpel bougie technique but uh, you know indian guidelines are still okay with using a needle cricothyroidotomy so when you are getting in a needle cricothyroidotomy um, uh, you can have commercially available sets or you can do a needle cricothyroidotomy with a normal 18 gauge cannula to a 18 gauge cannula you need to once you get in the uh, the needle over and the catheter in you remove the you you would first locate the cricothyroid membrane again cricothyroid membrane uh, is the one that would drop after the after the uh, thyroid cartilage Uh, and between the uh, thyroid and the cricoid cartilage you will get the cricothyroid membrane it is uh, extremely difficult uh, to palpate even in normal population uh, uh, in stress it becomes even more difficult so it is always a good idea to locate the cricothyroid membrane if you are having an anticipated difficult airway you can mark it and um, you know in crisis you can use that location that is one once you get in the needle um you aspirate and you confirm uh, the problem with cricothyroid membrane is literature says that there is a lot of posterior tracheal injury uh, reported with cricothyroid membrane with a needle cricothyroidotomy and which is uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which is there in the literature uh, uh, as we as we get better in our practice we may uh, have lesser incidence of posterior tracheal wall injury once you do, once you get into the uh, once you get into the cricothyroid membrane you need to remove the needle and you need to use a stiffer cannulas so the 14 gauges are stiffer cannulas but unfortunately they are for bigger kids and uh, adults for younger kids you can use an 18 gauge cannula and you can you can use a, a 2 cc or a 3 cc uh, syringe without the plunger connected to the catheter and you can use a nose worthy connector a 6 um, uh, mm endotracheal tube nose worthy connector and you can do a uh bag ventilation through the nose worthy connector that's a universal connector that can adapt the bag if you have a jet ventilation you can use jet ventilation uh, but you have to be careful about the pressure that you use during jet ventilation into the into the needle uh, the the most important aspect is when you are ventilating you need to allow the 
expiration which is uh, even more critical otherwise you end up having uh, barotrauma and things like that so you need to have a patent airway that will allow expiration uh, uh, so you need to give time for expiration and you need to allow a patent you need to hold the airway patent to allow um, you know expiration and you need to need to give time also for expiration uh, so you need to confirm the chest rise and you need to allow the chest to fall down so that is what these are the few aspects when you have to uh, uh, do a, a cricothyrotomy a cricothyrotomy it suggests that um, yeah, it will give you time for 10 to 15 minutes until you get a de definitive tracheostomy in place thank you sir any other questions or suggestions Ramesh, sir, you are not audible. You are muted. You are okay now? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. No, no. It is okay. The Everything is talked about, about cricotherotomy and all these things. I think when you, I feel on a practically, and there are some uh, protocols, that practically for all of us to take the most frightening situation is that when things are not all right and taking the scalpel and putting a scalpel in the trachea of a small baby, that is the most frightening one in that it's not, it's easy to put in a mannequins, easy to put in a cadavers, but once the child is all right and you feel that you have to take the scalpel or a needle into the trachea is the most frightening situation. It's not so easy what you are doing it. So you practice everything, the mannequins and situation arise you can do it, but I feel, I feel as much as possible, try to do mask as much as possible, get, and nothing like doing a tracheostomy in a small baby. Tracheostomy is the most easiest part. What is tracheostomy or a tracheostomy, whatever it is, water, open it and put in an endotracheal tube. So now, smaller the baby, the recommendation is to put a scalpel bougie technique is advised. That is, put a scalpel, put in a bougie, put an endotracheal tube. I think that's what it is. And if you want to put a needle, like what Shilp said, 99% of the time is a trachea is only for three to four millimeter. Needle will go beyond the uh, posterior wall. And you'll get more problems than when you put a scalpel, you will see that the anterior wall of trachea is seen and put in an endotracheal tube into that, even if you don't have a proper size tube. I think that's uh, probably it will take a long time. Only experienced people will be able to do it. You, and I'm sure the situation. Uh, will come very, very rarely and then I think everyone should be experienced in everything, especially in the mannequins and the cadaver, attend all the workshops, know all the things, so that in case of emergency, I think it's okay. Smaller the baby, scalpel bougie technique is better, though Indian uh, guidelines say the needle technique and the, the older child, you can use what Shilpa said is a needle technique is quite okay. And better, we just pray every day in the morning that we should not have a situation where we should do a cricket. That's what there's a Viraga in front of my hospital. I just pray that today there should not be any cricket. I think it's a, one of the very difficult and most difficult part of it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, she just to add. Uh, can I add Dibu? Dibu yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, I am, uh, I am Dr. Pramila, Shiju's colleague at Kims. Uh, I fully agree with Ramesh, sir, for that wonderful idea which he gave, which I myself used way back in 2003. Whatever difficult airway I was trained was under our senior pediatric anesthetist as well as a senior laryngologist. We used to run after them for a, all cases along with them in the OT, just helped a lot. So the, what sir said is very important for the younger generation. Definitely that anesthesia posting is very important. Because when you have a senior pediatric anesthetist and a senior laryngologist who are willing to teach you, they are the best gurus. And uh, uh, Shiju knows all of us are confident in difficult airways because of all this training we got. Thank you. So that's a wonderful idea, like uh, intensive care. Definitely anesthesia posting is very important. Thank you, ma'am. Shiju, uh, shall we wind up? Yeah, I think I'll, almost 9.20, 9.30. Okay. Uh, excellent uh, session, Dr. Tipu and the panelists, Ms. Sir and uh, Dr. Siltush.
so take take home message should be uh, probably should be thinking of ventilation more than intubation there are a lot of ways of ventilation intubation is only one way probably so thank you thank you very much so we'll wind up the session thank you sir thank you thank you deepo sorry i thank couldn't you, uh, share Deepu. my slides but that's okay somehow we managed and we're putting some messages to the people i think that's okay i think they are, uh, this is more okay than all this things i think more are the uh, more or less most of the points i think we have transferred to the people whatever it's it's a look like a very informal type of uh, i think it's good i liked it sorry i couldn't uh, share i think already time is there i think we have most of the points we have already discussed thank you so much Thank you, Ramesh and Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Shilpa. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you for having Shilp. me. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night, Doctor Shiju. Night. Please stop YouTube before you exit because you are the host. Okay. 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 okay.